So my name is Richard Hillgrove. I'm a publicist. I work with a lot of high-profile people um, who find themselves on, or quite often on a negative um, narrative strand in the media. And they feel like they've been literally buried alive by the media that seems to be painting them in a de you know, demonic fashion and not giving them a, a fair hearing, if you like. So it's not the only type of publicity I do, but that's one of my major strengths, is trying to recorrect narratives in the media. Um, since I've been working with Michelle for the last three months, and, and seeing all the people around Michelle and at all the press cuttings, Michelle has had a completely unfair um, hearing in the media. She's had a trial by media. And all I can say is that, um, and I've been quite blunt, I think the media, mainstream media, is probably owned, <laughs> well, it is owned, and I don't probably owned, it is owned by the 1%, if you like, and they don't really like seeing stories that conflict with their own agenda. And it would be argued that, fairly, I think, that the, the narrative that Russians have been involved with her ex-husband's wealth, it's dirty money, which seems to be a narrative that gets kicked around all the time, is completely a falsehood. Um, there's absolutely no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, yet this is a thing that rages in the media all the time, and it's quite handy for the 1% to have that because it would discredit Michelle's right to that money if it was in that fact dirty money. But looking at all the documents, uh, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. What's quite unique in Michelle's case, Michelle is one example of thousands and thousands of people who have been um, basically stolen from by a system of um, very, very questionable registrars insolvency practitioners, um, there seems to be a network at play with a system like a conveyor belt system for dealing with um, people where they want to dispose of assets, Michelle being one of them. But quite uniquely, and, and I'm sure it was very, very, very um, left field, was Michelle's recovery of asset schedules on a laptop that was given to her daughter by her late husband, not suspecting in a million years that a recovery of the assets from the laptop would be achievable. So the conveyor belt system went ahead and suddenly there was presented assets to the value of 800 million or more. I mean, looking into it, if further investigation is to be had and the real value is recovered, it could be up to 4 billion, not so 800 million, up to 4 billion. Michelle presented that, she had it verified by forensic experts and presented it in the family court and for whatever reason um, that was not acknowledged by the judge in his decision to award Michelle 26.6 million. So, and everyone I've spoken to says it's 800 million and it was very clear to the judge it was 800 million and for some reason, who knows why, that was ignored by the judge. But regardless of that, um, there is an award in the court of 26.6 million. When you think there's a network of people at play, who was, who was, Michelle was the largest creditor on that very unfair award by the judge. So it should have been 400 million if you accept that there was 800 million. Instead, for whatever reason, 26.6 was arrived at, which seems to be a number plucked from thin air. So the insolvency practitioner of her late husband's bankruptcy estate, which Michelle should be, uh, or is, the largest creditor, should have been acting in Michelle's interests to recover aggressively money from that estate. Instead, somehow the judicial system has allowed the same insolvency practitioner who's supposed to be acting in Michelle's interest to raise an invoice against Michelle for... 84,000, a paltry sum, a very small sum of 84,000. Obviously, Michelle has been awarded 26.6 million. Whether she agreed to accept the amount or not, it's still an order of a judge. So that sits there. How the insolvency practitioner, the same one who was managing the bankruptcy estate of her late husband, was allowed to go to a lower court and change her reference number so it wasn't migrated as it was supposed to. It's supposed to migrate with her 
because any judge making a decision would see that Michelle has been awarded 26.6 million. She's in credit, if you like. Somehow, with a different reference number and no acknowledgement of the existence of the award of 26.6 million, a lower judge, a registrar, clearly, in my opinion, um, working on behalf or certainly friendly towards the insolvency practitioner, bankrupted Michelle um, for £84,000. This is the same insolvency practitioner that was supposed to be recovering £26.6 million. What that did is put a big iron curtain down over Michelle's affairs. Michelle could not attend creditors' meetings. Michelle has no longer got any information as to how the recovery is going. Michelle has lost all her rights, and her, I believe her human rights have been breached. Um, but if for one, you are not allowed to migrate um, to a lower court and aggressively bankrupt someone who's got a credit of 26.6 million. So since then, Michelle has been trying to get information, has been trying to get investigators, but there's been a complete stonewall silence and the insolvency practitioner has not recovered or reported to anyone because I've seen um, creditors' reports from other creditors, if you like, and in all the time that they've been investigating uh, or supposedly recovering the assets, uh, which Michelle can't see whether they've recovered or not because they've bankrupted her um, illegally, um, they haven't reported to any other creditors one pound of recoverable assets, despite the fact there's clearly in existence over 800 million um, assets um, sitting there waiting to be recovered. So in my opinion, a whole lot of recovery probably has happened. Um, Michelle, it hasn't helped, and this is from the media point of view, that every time you talk about, talk about this, you just get the whole Russian thing come up. No one's willing to look at the systemic fraud which seems to be going on in this country on a daily basis. Um, and I've met, I mean, Michelle reaches out and helps so many other people. She's got her Michelle Young Foundation, and people from all walks of life come to Michelle for help. Michelle spends half a day on the phone helping other women, not just women, there's other, you know, all sorts, but particularly women who don't have a laptop with all the assets scheduled, but they know something's wrong. And bankruptcy is used to, to get them off the scent, if you like, and make them um, paralyzed in their ability to get what's rightfully theirs. Um, but all sorts of people have come out of the woodwork, and I've seen multiple other cases. I mean, the list is as long as your arm. Thousands and thousands of people have been put under the bus, if you like, while collective networks of insolvency practitioners, friendly registrars, um, banks are clearly, and clearly the insolvency service itself seems to be compromised in the system of sharing um, someone's assets. I mean, Mr. Melinda will talk about the fact that um, creditors are falsified as a way of basically creating a clean balance sheet so when the assets are stolen um, it stacks up but nothing seems to be put on the land registry in any case the the uniquely false reference number that seems to be used in a shadow court um, ensures that the actual paperwork doesn't sit on land registry and it doesn't seem to sit on the national records either so it seems to be a funnel that these cases go down with creditors falsified and everyone sharing in the spoils. Um, and Mr. Bowden will talk later, who I met, about how common postcodes are used. These postcodes used where money goes through a place called Finchley Road, I heard all about, um, where there's something like 200,000 different companies have been registered there. The assets then. Um, pushed through there into multiple locations offshore and hidden away. I think you, Michelle has a unique situation because she knows what the assets are that have now probably been broken down, but we could follow the money. And she needs justice to be done. She was never made bankrupt, really, and it needs to be nullified. She needs to have all her rights restored, and she needs to be able to get justice for herself and her daughters, in my opinion. In the lower court, where the bankruptcy notice was issued, 
uh, was the deputy registrar made aware that there was a family court decision? Um, from what I understood, it's, it's so high profile that it's very rare for any family court, family court case to be, for the details to be made public. But the judge, because it's so so in the public interest, the entire media was allowed to have full reporting on the family court case. So I, don't, I can't answer whether that registrar was told on the day. I'm sure Michelle, who represented herself, I believe, on the day, made it pretty clear. Um, yes, uh, the, the courts were aware, the family courts and the insolvency courts were aware, aware of the hard evidence I had from Scott's so computerised records. So the deputy registrar was aware that you had a judgment of Correct. 20, 28 in the lower court. Correct. In your favour. Yes. And he bankrupted you on an alleged debt that you disputed of eighty four thousand dollars. Which was unliquidated as well. Unliquidated. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he failed to take into account the fact that you had the means to pay any eighty four thousand dollar bill, whether it was genuine or not. It was actually even worse than that because I had one of the schedules from Coots Bank for three hundred and eighteen million had a life insurance policy on it, for um, which belonged to my ex-husband Scott. And Grant Thornton, the day they bankrupted me, they were aware of that life insurance policy. And at this that time, I'd only just um, employed a, an, an investigator, so we wasn't sure which insurance company and how much for. But Grant Thornton, who are a Rothschilds company, actually they were aware of that life insurance policy in 2010. From this document showing 318 million, which they're now saying they, there's no recovery because they haven't investigated it, or maybe they haven't stolen it, I don't know. But within that document, they was aware of that policy since 2010, and they bankrupted me unlawfully on, in 2015, knowing that that was an asset that did not belong to my ex-husband's estate. I'm familiar with the process uh -huh. of bankrupting people to prevent them issuing legal proceedings on the basis that the trustee has to issue the proceedings. Um, and I, if there was a judgment in your favour in the family court, quite apart from the life insurance policy, uh -huh. uh, I can't see how anyone could bankrupt you because the bankruptcy court is not a debt collecting court. It's there to protect people who can't manage their affairs. Your Lordship, that is not happening. I can say to everyone in this room that what is going on in this country that's meant to be called Great Britain is absolutely disgraceful. It is litigation, litigation enslavement. They are ignoring the law, ignoring evidence, and they are unlawfully bankrupting people exactly the same as the family courts are unlawfully taking children from their parents. And we'll pause uh, for a moment to allow a switch out in witnesses. We have a question for Michelle Young or anyone who can answer from His Grace. I'm not surprised to hear the story, the way he shared it with us, because I know of another case of an Egyptian friend who lost $4 billion. I, uh, I was asked to trace part of that money in Canada, found 205 million in what's known as Canada Trust Bank, and uh, asked a lawyer uh, in Canada to follow uh, that case, but both he and the son of this gentleman who, who died, we didn't know what happened to him, took him to hospital, he never came back in, in, in no time. I'm also aware of what happened to Cyprus. The European uh, uh, community robbed the people of Cyprus $5 billion rather than giving them $15 billion to, to help them uh, get out of their mess. They gave them 10 and then they took $5 billion from two banks, the Bank of Cyprus and Lycee Bank. And I know quite a number of friends in Cyprus um, who suffered as a result. My question to you, Michelle, what if someone offers to pay the 84000 Would they release uh, the money that is entitled to you or as being bankrupted, you have no right? 
What they actually did when they unlawfully, fraudulently bankrupted me, wrote this 84,000, with the previous litigation funding, which I had to use during the divorce proceedings, which was 17 million pounds, they threw that as debts in, on top of the 84,000. So what they tried to do was drown me in fake debts because these debts are not, they wouldn't be able to claim on the litigation funding until we recovered assets. So they did not adjudicate on these other debts, but they said that even if I had the 84,000, they would not release me from this unlawful bankruptcy. So they basically said they are going to hold on to my judgment of 26.6 .6 million plus the assets and for the next 15 years. So, hope, so as you said, they're waiting for me to drop dead. We are the power behind the ITNJ. Add your voice. Sign the treaty.